This week on CrossFeed. What do you look for in a church? The president celebrates the Passover. Do Australians believe in the resurrection? Jesus on Twitter. And why you should be an atheist instead of a Christian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. And uh, lest you think that uh, those of you who are watching the video, that Jim just cut his hair real short, um, he's not able to make it this week. And so we have a guest host. This is Pastor Joe Burnham. Hey, how you doing? It's good to be here with you on CrossFeed. I am Joe Burnham. I'm a pastor in Denver, Colorado. Uh, done an odd mix of, of ministry type things here. I, I, I shoot for the abnormal most of the time, uh, be it urban ministry, uh, working in a, a community of young adults here in, in downtown Denver, uh, do some stuff online. And, and this week, actually, the thing I'm most excited about in my life right now, my wife and I are getting ready to launch the Glocal Family Podcast. That's G-L-O-C-A-L-F-A-M-I-L-Y dot com. And it's a podcast where my wife and I will help families live lives that serve the greater good. So uh, that's who I am, and I'm glad to be here on CrossFeed this week. Cool. And we've got a link to that in the show notes, by the way, if anybody wants to check that out. All right. Well, where should we start this week? Uh, you know, I'm maybe the one that, that, that jumps out right up in front that's sitting here is uh, o- Obama and the, uh, and the Seder, that President Obama – uh, celebrates the Passover. Right. So um, this is from Newsday.com, although it's been all over the place. People would make a pretty big deal out of it. Um, on the Thursday night of um, – it'd be Monday Thursday, I guess. Um, he celebrated uh, a Seder f- uh, festival, and he said it imparted a sense of inclusion to uh, – or, or the local religious leaders – uh, said that it, it imparted a sense of inclusion to other religions that historically have felt left out. Now, uh, President Obama is, of course, a Christian. Um, he is still uh, struggling to find a church uh, where he feels comfortable um, in the D.C. area. Uh, he hasn't really uh, been to church uh, or joined a church since he left uh, his church in Chicago when he severed ties with Jeremiah Wright. And uh, so kind of interesting that as a Christian, uh, he celebrated the Jewish Passover and he celebrated Easter, too. Yeah, well, I, I think this is – it's interesting you can take a few different looks at this. You know, As I was sort of thinking about it, there's the, okay, is, is he, he functioning purely as, a, as a, a head of state and therefore he wants to let all of his constituents know that he, he values and, 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 and follows along with them, in which case you're sort of – separating uh, the, the, the kingdom of faith from the kingdom of, of civil society, which I don't necessarily, okay, you know, it's nice to include everybody and make everybody feel happy, you know, religious freedom, sort of uh, no state-funded religion or state, you know, created religion. Um, I think the thing that really is sort of curious in here is, is how did President Obama view what was going on that day? That would be the, that's the question I would really like answered is, 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 what was his um, understanding of that night? How did he understand the events that were going on? Was it purely a, uh, uh, hey, I just want to sort of experience and let you guys feel some love? Or was there, was there something else going on for him? And I, I think there's a lot of different uh, opportunities that could come out of that or an interesting discussion that could come out of that. Yeah. Now, we've talked about uh, groups like Jews for Jesus in the past and uh, the Apple of His Eye um, Ministries. And... Um, you know, so I, I've seen uh, a, a Seder uh, being done, and, and, and it's really fascinating as a Christian to watch it uh, because there's a lot of elements that we kind of look at and go, wow, that kind of reminds me of Jesus. Uh, and so, I mean, it's really pretty fascinating that way. Um, I have a hunch that that wasn't his uh, goal with that um, because, uh, frankly, groups like Jews for Jesus, uh, they tend to raise a lot of ire among Jewish groups. And this looked more like, uh, you know, he was trying to um, be sort of open and, and inclusive. 
So I, you know, one thing that I thought about as as I was reading this, um, this is uh, Rabbi Jay Rosenbaum of Temple Israel in Lawrence said, by conducting a Seder in the White House, he's sending a message of respect to all peoples of faith and showing that we need to accept and appreciate each other more and judge each other less. But I don't, I don't know that he was really sending a message to all peoples of faith. I think he was just sending a message to the Jews. Well, I think, yeah, there was an open opportunity to include one specific group uh, in that instance. And and we'll see. Does he fast during Ramadan this next year? Does he how, – how is that going to play out that he's going to you know try and, and include and incorporate? And, and I think you're right that there are um, – I know I've been through a, a, a Seder with uh, Pastor Kevin Parviz, who's, who's connected to uh, Apple of His Eye. And so he every year uh, has a, a Jewish mission congregation in St. Louis um, and every year does a, a Passover Seder and is very uh, intentional to point out Christian uh, meaning within um, – the actual the context of the, of, of the Passover meal. There's other things where I've seen it and been involved where it's it's much more like they're trying to do it sort of straight from the this is how you know they would have celebrated it in, in David's day or in, in Joshua's day or or whenever um, where it was sort of like well that's there's interesting opportunities to look for that sort of inclusion or that that Christian message but it's not blatantly there. It's nice to sort of see some background and some history type of stuff. Um, but but ultimately, I think it, it was really aimed at being sort of a, hey, we just want to share some love with you two, and, and our roots sort of fit in with your roots at this point, and, and so we can sort of all get along kind of thing. Yeah. Now, um, I noticed in this article, and, and, and none of the articles about it, um, we didn't have any comments from atheist groups or Muslim groups, and I would have been really interested to hear their reaction to this. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, especially recently, um, about this um, sort of the America is not a Christian nation. And um, I, I've seen that as a headline or variations on that a lot uh, over just the past couple of weeks. Uh, I think a lot of it stemmed from when he was in Turkey. Uh, he made uh, some sort of comment to that regard uh, because he wanted to say, look, we're not a Christian nation. You know, we're a nation that includes all people and, and everyone's welcome and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, you know, interesting. And I guess, you know, the other angle here is, is um, you know, is he, by participating in this, compromising his faith as a Christian? Well, and I, I, I think that's that's the question. There's sort of the formal head of state, um, you know, going through and, and, and doing something and joining somebody to, to, to say, hey, here's some love uh, from this area where I serve you. But but then the, the question comes down is what was going on in his own heart and his own faith, and 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 was this a a his belief that that we're all one and the same? Was it exploring the roots of his his Christian faith? Was it looking for symbolism that that led to? Uh, or the, that flows out of that points to to Jesus, and and I I think that's that's the thing that I would really like to find out the most of. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's something that we can really answer because I don't think he's actually said anything on that, or I haven't seen anything on that. No, no, neither have I. And you know, ultimately, we always have to go back to remembering that he's the commander in chief, not the pastor in chief. And so, you know, we can't look at at his actions necessarily, and and um. And not even necessarily. I mean, we can't really look at his actions and say, oh, he's, you know, setting some sort of a, a religious example, you know, or, or something like that. Um, you know, uh, President Bush uh, caught a lot of flack for making sort of universalist uh, comments um, and, you know, things like that. And, and you know, it's hard to be the president. I, I would not want to have to be in his shoes when he's got to make these kind of decisions. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe that, um, that salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. And, um, but then there's all these people that I am in charge of taking care of and they don't believe that. And so, yeah. you know, how do I, how do I deal with that? And, and send a message to them that, uh, I'm going to take care of you just as much as I'm going to take care of the Christians. So. And I, I think this is one of those places where, you know, the, the, the Lutheran background that we have, that, that dichotomy of, of understanding the two kingdoms and, and, and these two realms, it gives us a, an ability to work with this idea a lot more than, than, than most people, the, real, the reality of, of the, this, 
you know, church ruling through grace uh, in, in, in one aspect of, of our lives, but we also have the state that, that rules through the law in, in a different aspect of our lives. And, and here the, the president sits in a spot where in his own life as, 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 as you know, the commander in chief where he, he works by the law and serves people according to the law and through the law. And, and, uh, and, and so he functions no matter who people are to protect and love them. But in, in the church, he's in the same spot that, that you and I find ourselves every Sunday where he's needing that same grace that, uh, that, that is preached from, from the pulpit and comes from the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the question then, uh, the next question is, um, maybe that the we just need a church that just says no more Christians altogether. And uh, so we have uh, this is a really kind of interesting uh, publicity stunt. Basically, um, it's a Florida church, the Mosaic Church of Crestview, um, that's using the slogan "No more Christians." Now, this is a Christian church, all right, and they are advertising a serious of discussions uh, with names like why you should be an atheist instead of a Christian or why you should be a Muslim instead of a Christian. You know, I, I, I looked at it and, and, and I noticed that they have the line here that their, their goal is to spark conversation and attract the attention of people who have grown lackadaisical in their religious practice. Um, and I think actually this does it. It, it provides a nice tie in into the previous article, the idea of, you know, you sort of go through the motions and include whatever religion you want as opposed to this concept where it's saying, no, if, if you're, if you're not going to actually boldly live out your faith as a Christian, then why, why grab the label? Is it because, you know, um, you're American and therefore you love God, mom, and apple pie, or uh, is it is it you know that this Christian faith actually means something? So there's, I, I think it's an interesting conversation to try and 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 spark a discussion around it. You know the idea of um, what does this actually mean? What what is the actual substance of of your faith? But. Part of the the campaign, I guess I'm the, the the no more. I don't see necessarily how no more Christians necessarily accomplishes that goal. Now there has been um, in over the past few years um, movement to sort of get rid of the Christian label and say I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not a Christian, um, but which is means the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, actually, in, in, in a way, well, I guess it depends. If, if you take Christian as in little Christ, therefore, it would be the idea of follower of Jesus. So they have a very common sort of connection that way. But but at another level, there's a almost an element of um, it, when you go by Christian, it, it sort of has this I am one who is defined by Christ um, as opposed to I am defined by what I do in the footsteps of Christ which would be more follower of Jesus. And so in that sense, I would much rather be a Christian than be a follower of Christ because I don't follow very well. Even when I try and do my best, I need him to define me instead. That's a really good point. You know, I never thought about that that way before. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a law gospel thing um, that a follower of Christ is very law focused. This is what I do. Uh, whereas as a Christian, I am, um, you know, I'm, I'm defined not by what I do to keep myself in relationship with Christ, but and what Christ has done for me and, and what he continues to do for me. That's a good point. So, um, so I don't, I, you know, I look at this and I, I say, well, it's certainly going to get attention, you know? Um, but at the same time, I wonder, is it deceptive? Is it uh, sort of disingenuous that, because they really don't mean that you should be an atheist instead of a Christian. Um, you know, they don't mean that you should be a Muslim instead of a Christian. Now, uh, right now in my Sunday morning Bible class, we're actually working through a document that was written, um, in the late 1800s by an atheist, uh, basically just picking apart the Bible and saying the Bible's not the word of God because of this, 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 and this. And it was sent to me by an agnostic friend. And he said, how do you respond to this? And I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to respond to it, but not just me responding to it, but to have um, those who attend our Sunday morning Bible study uh, to collectively respond to it and for me to take it to them and say, how do you respond to this? And uh, so we've been working through it and discussing it and, um, you know, and, and it's been really interesting and uh, we're, we're just, 
we we haven't gotten very far into it so far, so I'm looking forward to um continuing with it. It's it's been a lot of fun. Um so you know, I think that I don't know. I guess if I were gonna do something like this, I'd word it more um which is better, atheist or Christian or 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 you know, something like that. Because I I just I don't think that he's really people are gonna go, huh? And he's gonna go, No, nah, well no, not really, you know. Yeah. Well, I think it's more of a, it's it's a publicity stunt in that the line itself is designed to get a lot of attention. But if if you don't have any follow up to it or don't have a solid way of following it up, and the thing that would actually really scare me is in the process of this is is what they they prop up for the atheist or what they prop up for the Muslim would be some sort of stereotype that would that wouldn't be very true. And and in the process of uh, trying to to stir up some controversy, they would actually turn around and, and insult the very people that were called to share the gospel with, which is really sort of um, not a great approach to starting out, you know, a, a positive conversation with somebody that you live in uh, in contradiction with on, on the basis of faith or on the right. area of faith. Yeah, because then it comes across as why we're better than you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and and isn't there an opportunity to go and, and, and meet them? And, 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 and I mean, if you're putting up a, a solid argument of who these people are, um, which is something that I notice quite a bit from, from the atheist community these days, is, is talking about we are not all of these things that Christians stereotype us as. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're, we're not miserable. We're not uh, completely immoral and, and heathen. We're not, you know, all hedonistic. We're not... And, and they just go through this list of, of all of these things and say, no, we, we can be all of this stuff that you say that we're not. Um, yeah. and so the, yeah, the, how do we, um, how do we have healthy conversations with those who are not part of our, uh, our religious heritage and, and maybe in the process share Jesus with them. And I don't know that you can do that through a publicity stunt. I don't think you can. I, I know that I, I live in a community that is that is largely uh, non-Christian and spend a lot of time with people who are outside of the faith. And, and, and I'm convinced the only way you're ever going to get uh, into those connections is relationships. Yep. Spending yep. a lot of time with them. Yeah, here in Delaware County, Iowa, there's not a lot of atheists <laughs> or anybody that, you know, <laughs> if, if you say I'm not Christian, you know, I mean, you know, the, the only people around here that – um that are sort of explicitly not Christian um, are the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and they say they are. So you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, those who do, who deny being Christian, just you know, I have more of them in my building than you do in your town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, probably in the whole county. So, um, but at the same time, I I've got lots of um, friends online, um, yeah, in uh, different forums and stuff that that I've run into, and not not deliberately sought out or anything. You know, I, I think we got to be careful about sort of going atheist hunting. Um, yeah. You know, you just got to l- find people where you're at. And, you know, and um, so I hang out in forums of people that uh, share common interests with me. And um, uh, one in particular, there's, there's a lot of atheists there. It just sort of works out that way. And um, we've, we've had some really great discussions. There's been one going on this week. Um, about that, somebody, a Christian asked a question, okay, and she says, I'm not trying to be insulting or anything like that, but, um, all right, I want the atheists to, to explain to me what is your, um, motivation for morality. And, um, and it's led to a really interesting discussion because, I mean, there's a lot of atheists on there that say, hey, you know, I'm very, you know, I consider morality very important and, um, and stuff like that. And they explain why. And, and, you know, and it, it was really helpful to have that discussion and understanding. And, and then that led to other discussions and it, you know, just sort of, um, branched off in there. But, um, part of it is you got to be in a place where people are at least willing to discuss things without it erupting into a flame war too. So, yeah, and, and I think being in a spot where you've you've demonstrated that you're not going to go off on 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 Jesus immediately, that you're going to engage in conversation, that you're going to be friendly, that you're going to listen to them, that it's going to be a, a mutual dialoguing sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and and I, I have a very similar because I live in, a, in a, an area that has such a large uh, non-church, anti-church population. I I got involved in my community and just spend a lot of time serving in my community, and that naturally puts me in connection and relationship with people. They find out about the pastor thing. A few months later, they begin to say, okay, why are you not like other pastors I know? 
Um, and, and that's where dialogue comes in and conversation comes in. But I, I intentionally always wait for them to start the conversation. You know, that's something that I always struggle with is the pastor thing. Um, you know, I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. I try to make a point of, of, um, not, you know, not sort of in your face, but, but, you know, mention it. Yeah. I went to church Sunday or, you know, or stuff like that. But I find myself reluctant with people that I don't know well to say, yes, I'm a pastor, you know? And yeah. because all the, like, as soon as they find out I'm a pastor, they've got all of these different ideas of what pastors are like. And the thing is, the, when I was f sort of, when the, 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 the call came in a sense, um, you know, all these people kept coming up to me and saying, Hey, you'd make a good pastor. You should be a pastor. And, and I kept saying, no, because I don't fit that mold. And I don't, I don't want to be in that mold. You know, I'm, I'm not like that. <laughs> and uh, so I was really reluctant, um, to answer the call. And, um, you know, finally I, I realized that I, I can still be me. And, um, you know, I, I suppose I've, there's certain things about me that I, I've changed. Um, but you know, I had to cut the rat tail, you know, <laughs> but, but, say, uh, you got to do certain things. So congregations aren't completely blown off by you. you right. the, the people of God have to listen to you as well. Yeah. 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 So, you know, um, but, uh, there's, I, I, sometimes I feel bad about, so, you know, it's like, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I look, I work for a local nonprofit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I struggle with the same thing. It, it, it's really, a ch and, and it's not that I'm ashamed to be a pastor. I, I love that, that, that part of my life, that, that calling from God. Um, I love it when I, I walk into a, I did it, I walked into a hospital probably a month and a half ago and I was going to go and see a, a two year old boy, uh, who was, who was in the hospital and met his mom there. And, and she looked at me and her first line was, you don't look like a pastor. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that was that was the introductory. Wait a second, you're not what I was expecting. <laughs> um, and and so just I, I love that some of those aspects of it. But yeah, there's that that thing in, in the community when I'm talking to people I don't know or people who are going to come with stereotypes in it, because I realize that immediately I'm going to have to spend however much longer just breaking down their stereotypes so they can get past to hear me so we can actually begin developing a positive relationship that that maybe someday will move towards me having an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it was interesting on this why not be an atheist thing that it it kicked over on a on a different side some people who actually apparently seem to to hold on to some biblical truth and ideas and yet see it having absolutely no connection in their lives is a survey done in Australia. Uh, it talks about fundamental Christian beliefs being strong, uh, but it having absolutely no relevance or impact on, on people's lives in the sense of they believe that Jesus uh, rose from the dead. They believe in the resurrection, and yet there's more people that believe in the resurrection than people who call themselves Christian. Yeah. Uh, this is just an odd article. Yeah, this is bizarre. Um uh, we've got uh, four in ten Australians do not consider themselves born again, but they still believe that Jesus rose from the dead. One in ten doesn't believe he even existed. Um, that's of those who do not um, consider themselves born again. Some other interesting um, uh, statistics. 85% uh, who did not identify as born again, uh, including those of other religions, 45% believed in the resurrection. Um, so the number that believed in the resurrection included agnostics and secularists. That fascinated me. Okay. Yeah. You, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but you're agnostic. So, you know, sort of like, sometimes I just don't understand human behavior. Um, been watching too many zombie movies. You know what? <laughs> what? Yeah. I, I, I sat here and I read this and I just sort of, What? You know, it, it, to 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 know the story, to believe the story, and, and yet to to not see any sort of connection or 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 um, value in the story for your own life, just it it, it left me completely mind boggled. Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of sat here hanging and going, what? <laughs> 
Now, um, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but my roommate in college uh, was agnostic, um, atheist for all practical purposes. He said, now, I understand what Christians believe about Jesus. Here's my question. If Christians really believe that he was willing to go through all that to save them from hell and give them eternal life. He said, if I believed that, that would change my life. If I believed that someone were willing to do that for me, to, to save me from such a horrible fate and give me such a great thing, he said, my whole life would be dedicated to, to his honor. Why is it that so many Christians who believe that do not, it, it, it just, it, it, you know, it barely touches their lives at all? We're in trouble. And, and maybe that's even the, the, the point of difference between, between Australia and what we see in the United States where, where people believe this stuff. They still claim the title Christian, but there's no functional shift or change or um, impact on their lives. Where in Australia, they're being a little bit more honest about it and say, yeah, I believe that stuff, but I'm not living a life that looks like a Christian, so I'm not going to call myself one, or I, I don't see myself as one defined by Christ. And so I'll, so maybe there's just a little bit more honesty in Australia about that issue. It could be. It could be. So, um, but, but yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a weird thing to if, – if you really believe the resurrection and, and, and that Jesus offered himself on the cross – for you so that you can be right with God. How does that not play into, in, in some way, um, in not saying that, that, that Christians are going to be all of a sudden, we're going to be Christ followers and we're going to be defined by the work we do in response to what Jesus has done for us. You know, we don't want to go there, but, but, but not allow their, their life to, in, in more dramatic ways, be defined by, by Christ as, as Christians, ones who are, are, identified with Christ and defined by him. Yeah. Now, there are a couple other interesting uh, uh, statistics here. Uh, 31% believe Jesus lived B.C., which stands for before Christ. Which, right. the thing is, depending how that question was worded, I believe he did too. I believe he was born roughly for B.C. Yeah, you know? four, so. so it's like, so, yeah, yeah. What do you, you know, what do you mean by that, you know? Um, 57% knew Easter was connected with the death of Jesus, but 87% knew, knew that it concerned the resurrection. So, which, <laughs> how do you believe in resurrection without death? Yeah. <laughs> Aren't the two sort of necessary? <laughs> but you know, I've, you know, I've, I've heard some interesting comments that's, um, you know, there's that whole debate about, do you use an empty cross uh, in your church or in your, you know, decor or whatever, um, or do you use a crucifix? And I've heard some guys say, well, you've got to use a crucifix because um, there's no salvation without a beaten, bloody corpse hanging there. Yeah. Uh, okay, a little graphic, but, you it, know. It um, is a little graphic. It's a little, but it, that's also Good Friday. Right, right. And so... You know, you can't have, and you know, and then on the other side, it's yes, but we worship a risen Savior, not a, uh, you know, and and so there, you know, there's the whole debate. I personally, I think they're both right. Um, <laughs> so I'll sort of use whatever I've got handy. Um, <laughs> yeah, and maybe you need both in the church, and you ha you have whenever you're going to do a, a a Christ sacrificing for himself for us type of sermon, you always reference and gesture towards the the bloody crucifix, and whenever you're talking about resurrection life, you refer to the the empty one. Be yeah, so, you know, yeah, we, just sort of switch it right along with the pyramids each week and the, the, all the other decorations in the church. See, we've got one of those statues in the front, you know, with Jesus kind of standing there with his hands out, you know. And so it's it's the risen Christ, um, but you can see the wounds, and yeah. it, and that kind of covers both sides. I guess. It, it does, and 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 it very much fits in with Revelation and and the fact that that even in eternity he is he is the Lamb who was slain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that one. Oh, I just realized today was like Doubting Thomas Sunday, and I I usually sort of tie in that statue, 
you know, because it's the whole, here's the wounds, you know, look and see. And, and, uh, because it's so prominent in the, you know, the front of our church and, and, uh, and I didn't do that this year. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll invite everyone back for Monday and just catch, I forgot to do this yesterday. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Bonus sermon this week. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure I'd get a lot of takers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And 4%. But, but, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just, I had uh, uh, 4% confused Easter and Christmas, uh, Jesus' birth. So that doesn't surprise me. I, you know. Yeah, that, that one I can completely understand. And 4% isn't a, isn't a great number. And it's not even. Especially if you're. You're talking about, you know, how many, you know, one in 10 were, were atheists or, you know, then that means even 6% of your atheists know which holiday goes with which. So, you know, you're, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. So, and, uh, so 90% of non-born against identify Jesus with Christianity. <laughs> okay. I, I would hope so. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, 60- Although, you know, what's interesting on that when I, I was doing some, some stuff on on common perceptions of of Christians from those who are not in, in, involved and are connected to the church, and the thing that was interesting is is everybody's objections towards the church have absolutely nothing to do with Jesus, and 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 when they look at the church, the one thing they don't see is Jesus. Oh, and somehow yeah. he gets lost uh, in in the midst of, of of everything else, and 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 so at a certain extent there so to identify Jesus with with Christianity or to identify Jesus with the church at least that's a positive step. Whereas in a lot of cases, what do you think about when you think of church? And the the, the one thing people don't bring up is Jesus. Right, right. It's like politics and you know everything else. Or um, yeah, politics a lot. <laughs> <laughs> politics. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you think of when you think of Christians? Uh, folks on the family. Uh, you know, um, the really Jerry started, Falwell, Pat the, Roberts, yeah. and Rat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I guess that's a good thing. Um, and Australia actually has a Christian party. Um, to you know, just to top it off, they actually have one of their major parties is the Christian party. So, interesting. I wonder how that works when Jesus does the whole "my kingdom is not of this world" type of thing, and they. I've I've always wondered how you try and blur those things together and say we're the Christian government. Yeah, you know, I've I've kind of wondered that too. But you know, if you want to see the results, just uh, you know, go over to Sweden and look yeah. at the state of the um, the state Lutheran Church over there, or take a look at the direction that the Anglican Church is going in um, in England and and stuff like that, and. Um, you see what happens when you try to to blur that line. Everything just yeah, it's it, it, it's never a good thing for the church. And I think there's a uh, there's I think we actually have something going on the entire idea of separation of church and state in the in the U.S. I think that's actually it, it's the saving grace for the church. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, you know, you look at the extreme example in say China, all right, mm-hmm. where you have not only are they separated. Well, you do have a sort of official recognized Chinese Christian church um, that is really not a church at all. It's more of a um, uh, pep rally for the government. Um, whereas, and the but the church is thriving um, in underground yeah. churches uh, because people are looking for the real truth. And um, and you know, I've, I've said this, and and. I, in in America, we are so um, pampered that you know we can we can worship where we want. There's you know Bibles on every street corner and um, practically, and you know you can you, you take a look at a town and and see how many taverns compare to the number of churches, and you know usually it's about even, and um, it's you know we're we've got it so easy that we take it for granted. And that's what allows all sorts of false teachings to come in and stuff because people just, you know, they don't even think about it. All right. You go to China and, and ask people, are you a Christian? All right. Nobody's going to say, yeah, but I don't attend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, my grandma was a Christian. Well, and- I, I associate with that church. I associate with that secret house group down the street. But, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I pass by there every week. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I decide I need some of that, that's where I'm going to go. But. But yeah, it's it, it's and which which driving dropping back to the the Obama article and all the talk of we're not a Christian nation. And I think to a large extent that's that's actually a good thing to 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 clear out and create a distinction between that which is Christian and that which is 
sort of um, the American civic religion kind of God, mom, and apple pie type of religion. Um, I, I think there's actually something sort of healthy in, in, in creating that distinction that, that, that calls Christians to say, no, we are something different in the midst of this. We're not part of popular culture. Um, we even in some ways, because of the life that Jesus calls us to, defy what is often American. Um, you know, a lot of the consumerism, a lot of, of those kinds of things that is distinctly uh, in contradiction with, with, with the, the message of Jesus. Right. So talking about, you know, uh, looking at churches and people's relationship with churches and, and consumerism, you know, sometimes we can take a consumeristic approach uh, to church and sort of what can I get out of it and that. Um, but also it just, I mean, just considering that there comes the question of, uh, what are people looking for in a church? And, um, so this is actually a, a blog post from marketing integrity. Um, but it, it, it came across my desk and, and it really fascinated me. Now there's a 15 minute video. And so I, I do encourage people to go check out the video. I think it's really, um, uh, it's really well done and, um, <clears throat> and it really hits on some good points, but the um and the the guy that wrote the blog post did not produce the video it was sent to him and he was just commenting on it um but i thought his comments were good and and he's fo- planning a follow up to it and i haven't read that yet um but he said basically as you look at at this video you can see and these are uh, sort of young adults uh 20 somethings um and and what are they looking for in a church and, and, you know, what, what do they like? What don't they like? Uh, what's a turn off and, and stuff like that. And it came up with nine, uh, sort of themes seem to come through, uh, in this video at least. Um, and those things are community, authenticity, mentorship, passionate leaders, interactive environment, uh, involvement, relevant engagement, intellectually challenged, and, technology and internet presence. So I thought it'd be worth just sort of looking at this. This is really, you know, for, you know, I'm definitely targeting the, the, the Christians here to look at uh, your church and, and how do, is your church doing these things? And what could your church do to help uh, better meet the needs of those in your community? Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not the, a person that, um, that, that thinks that our goal, uh, that my goal as a pastor, that our goal as a church is to see how many, um, well, as the expression is used around here, uh, how many butts we can get in the pews. <laughs> All right. Um, mm-hmm. because really, well, I was going to say, yeah, you can take the approach for what, what can we do just to get them here? But, but there's, you're trying to do something more than just get them there. Right. Right. So, because, you know, if you really, if you just get them there, you know, maybe a publicity stunt or whatever, and then that's it, you know, they're going to come once, maybe twice just to see, because the first time they come and they don't get anything out of it and they go, well, maybe it was just an off day, you know, <laughs> and if, you know, if you're lucky, they'll, they'll come back a second time. But, you know, if, if you don't have something to offer, um, that's really going to feed them something that the world can't offer them, um, you know, they're not going to be back. And really that can't be our, our goal. Um, you know, yeah, it's great if you can get them there because then you can talk to them. You know, it's a, it's a good place to, to, to talk to people and, and, you know, and help them and meet their needs. Um, and certainly, uh, there's a lot of, uh, need meeting that you can do by sharing the word of God, um, in a, in a service. Um, uh, but, uh, there needs to be more. So, well, Jumping back to the, the article on Australia and, and, and this, this disconnect between the belief in the resurrection and the impact on life, just, just a, a few ideas running through this list. The idea of, of, of being in community, being, being in, a, in, in the concept of a church, a group of people who actually resonate with the idea that the resurrection impacts life and your people that are together in the process of figuring out how does this impact uh, everyday life. Um, there's a there's there's an authenticity a realness about struggle as you try and see where this connects as you struggle to actually live this out in your everyday life mentorship people to walk alongside you uh, as you're trying to make these connections okay I believe this but what does it 
what does it mean about when I go to work on Monday? What does it mean? Um, you know, this morning we had a sort of a earth theme at, at, uh, at where I, I'm working for, for a church right now, and I was preaching and it had sort of a, how does the gospel connect to this whole sort of being green type of thing going on with Earth Day on Wednesday? And, and, and trying to help draw the connection that, that we should care about this, not because uh, it, it's this law sort of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, take care of the earth kind of thing, not because uh, we love Al Gore or not because we shouldn't do it because we hate Al Gore, but we should be involved in this because – because we as Christians are, are people who are, are interested in the same thing that Jesus is into and, and, and desire to see his gospel you know, happen in our midst as, as, as the, the word of God is proclaimed and, and foretastes of the feast to come happen here and now. And, and part of this, this feast to come is a new heavens and a new earth. And, and, and in the process of being green, we can give people this little tiny sort of taste of what eternity might be like. And we have this entire different reason for being that way. It's not like we're trying to save our only hope. You know, because if we if we let the environment go, then we all die. And well, no, that's God's deal. But but how does this sort of play in? And and to to be in a place where you can sort of struggle with that kind of stuff and figure out how does the gospel relate to how I make these decisions about the use of resources and how does it play in, in into how I, I treat my neighbor and how does it play into how I do work on, on the rest of the week to to process through all of that and 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 connect the the resurrection to those events uh, to af- aspects of everyday life and through mentorship and having passionate leaders who guide that and and being interactive where you can engage in those discussions and feel like you can actually talk about that stuff and I mean, so in a lot of ways, a lot of these things that are that are on that list, it seems to be stuff that really it's sort of like, okay, we have this intellectual sort of ideal over here that is the doctrine of Christianity. How do we bring it into life? How does it, what is it? Is, is it just a whole bunch of stuff written out on sheets of paper or does it, is it actually something that, that is, is living and, and manifests itself in us? Yeah. Um, and so when I see that, that's, that's a lot of what I see is, is, is this is really the sort of stuff necessary to take those who believe in the resurrection uh, but, but have no connection to Christ as far as their life goes, uh, like we saw in the Australian survey, and, and help bring the resurrection to, to fruition in, in their everyday life. Yep. And, you know, and just tying this stuff in, you, you look down and, and Joe's already mentioned kind of a theme, you know, that's running through this. This is all, you know, a lot of, a lot of these things you just sort of call folks on discipleship. Um, but, you know, some of the things in here I find missing in a lot of churches. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking down this list and I'm thinking about my own church and thinking, you know, what could we do differently? Uh, what should we be doing differently? What have we been neglecting? Um you know, and, you know, you think about community. Now, I mean, around here, um, living in small town, Iowa, you know, community, this is a community where you, when you drive down the road, all right, you put your hand on the steering wheel, and as as you, as you cars approach you, you go like this, like, hey, how you doing, you know? And, um, you know. I had that in small town Nebraska. You know what you need to do sometime just to really confuse people is give them one of these, go... <laughs> People just they, they don't know what to do with you then. <laughs> Drive away fast. <laughs> but but I know exactly what you mean. There's that that sort of hey, we all know each other. We all know everything about each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the last I, I time know what I you was had in dinner last night, there, there was the expression that. Um, you know, in this town, you don't need to use your turn signals because everyone knows where you're going anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, is there actual genuine community in the midst of that? You know, are, are the people uh, connected or do they just sort of know everything about each other and know everybody? Is, is there that, that, that closer, tighter bond sort of thing? Right, right. Because um, gossip is not community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So, no, and that's a good point. And so, it's, you know, really community, what we're talking about is not just knowing people, but caring about them and, and, and showing them that you care about them by, you know, finding out what their needs are and meeting those needs. And that's really what a church needs to be doing. I mean, that's, it's, 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 it's one of those things that's such a no brainer. And yet you hear it and you go, oh yeah. <laughs> <You know>? Oh, <laughs> exactly. It's brilliant. And, and, and yet. 
and, and I think there's you know sort of a historical cultural thing. I mean, Lutherans and the, and the whole German thing. We we historically the Stoic Germans are very good at at being sort of shut off and closed and not engaged in community, and and so a lot of this idea of of uh, you know the, the the honesty and the and the, and the connection and 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 the, the the communication that goes on in there can can be a bit scary. I think there's the the deep compassionate loving concern there. You just don't see it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it it comes across it, in the sort of disguise. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's 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 sort of. Uh, well, we had this this discussion one time. It was um, you can say whatever you want about a person as long as you say bless his heart afterward. <laughs> oh, good grief! Oh man, that guy's uh, total scum. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Makes it all okay. But I think that the thing that's different in here, with the exception of, of technology and an internet presence, um, all of the stuff on that list, it, it's not the typical things that you think of when you're talking about how do we connect to young people. You know, there's, there's no um, pastor wears the wraparound mic and looks like Britney Spears or Madonna as he's preaching. And there's no they have the really cool hit band. And there's yeah. none of the big expensive lighting systems or the video production or the, the you know – uh, hip cool video th- i mean there's some of that in the idea they have they have some technological savvy they use technology to help communicate what they're they're doing um but but the the vast majority of this is actually centered on like you said discipleship it, it was it was give us something of substance give us give us reason that this this um this idea that the uh the, the ivory tower type of version that you talk about uh, steps out of the ivory tower and, and in every, uh, into everyday life. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes in Lutheran Church we talk about this, we call it vocation. Um, yeah. That, you know, this is, this is how this, this is how, you know, changing diapers, you know, what does that have to do with Jesus? All right. Well, you are, you know, you are being Jesus to that child by, meeting their needs by doing what you need to do, even doing things that are unpleasant um, to meet someone's needs. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Of course, what Jesus did on the cross was a whole lot more unpleasant um, than changing a diaper, but it's it's still that I'm going to do... You didn't have my two-year-old. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, but I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um in fact it's funny that you bring that one up because I I remember clearly one day I had just finished changing a diaper when I ran across that fabulous Luther quote, quote on the the glorious work of changing the diaper and and it was uh it, it was it, it not only put me in my place that day but it, it was it was a good reminder that that being a dad was of 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 utmost great importance and and wonderful holy spiritual work. Yeah. No, I, I will, um, with this technology and internet presence, you know, obviously I, ha- I have some thoughts on this, you know, running a podcast. Um, and, uh, but I, I, and I do think it's important, um, uh, that churches do recognize, uh, that there's an internet out there. Um, and that, you know, especially when you're talking about 20 somethings, they're all on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, get on Facebook, get on now. Twitter tends to lean a little bit older. Although... Twitter's more a 30 and 40. And it's interesting because if, if you go to the, you know, they have the events where I don't know, well, I guess you're probably in an area where there's not enough people on Twitter to do tweet ups. Nah, we don't have tweet ups around here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In, in the city, we have tweet ups where we get all of the people who are on Twitter that gather together at the same place and, and spend the night hanging out. And so you have uh, virtual people in real beer. <laughs> and uh and and so we all hang out for a night and it is it's 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 30 40 somethings uh even some 50 something so it's it's a different crowd than what you think about normally with technology um and it's all these people who use it for business and have all of these different sort of needs for it but it, it another great way and it's the same idea i i go to the tweet ups and and have an opportunity to meet people that i would never otherwise connect with and spend time with my wife and i are going to have a guy over for dinner uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks, and and he lives half time here, half time in Portland. Uh, he's gay and has been living with his partner for 21 years. Um, 
a guy who I would never meet in, in normal circumstances and situations. And yet, thanks to Twitter, I met him. We've had an opportunity to connect and have an opportunity to sort of engage and, and, and talk. And we sat and had a, a, you know, a couple drinks one night and, and talked for about three hours about faith and, and about life and, and experiences. And, and just, I mean, it opens up this door to so many different conversations. And, and, and there's the idea of the technology and internet presence is you want to meet these people? Go where they are. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I around here, people are not very tech focused. Um, you know, they're farmers, they're factory workers, they're, you know, blue collar types. And, um, but on fa I got on Facebook, uh, because I got an invite from, uh, from someone who had been invited by her daughter. And, um, and I'd kind of avoided it just because. It was like, oh, I don't have time. Yeah, I've got too many other things. I don't have time for Facebook. It's a big time suck. And, um, and so, but fi finally, you know, I, I thought, well, okay, fine, you know. And then I realized that a lot of our high school and college age kids, even including the college age ones that are off at college right now, they're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Right? So, huh. Okay. So I sent out a few friend requests. And they accepted me as their friends. All of a sudden, I know what's going on in their lives. You know, even the ones that are not in church on a regular basis, I know what's going on in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, which for a pastor is great. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's just, I, I know more about what's going on in these kids' lives that I, you know, once in a while see them on the street and say, hey, how you doing? And some of them will acknowledge me in public and some of them won't. All right? Mm -hmm. But I know what's going on in their lives, and if they're having a tough time, I can send them a note and say, "Hey, I'm praying for you. Um, hey, if you know, if you wanna, if you wanna talk, I'm here. You know, whatever. If if something great happens to them, I can send them a note and say, "Hey, you know, that's awesome. That's great. You know, and um, just to let them know that I'm there, let them know that I care. And and so as a, for a pastor, it's just it's just a tremendous opportunity. I wish more of our members were on Facebook so that I could keep up with their, you know, with their daily life. Just lives. so you can know what's going on in their world. Yeah. yeah. And well, and everything gets published there. And so, you know, all, all of, of life's, uh, the, the good and the bad and the ugly is there. And, and so you do, you get, you actually probably get a more honest look into the lives of people that way than, than you would ever have if they were just sitting down and talking to you. Oh, absolutely. Because I know they wouldn't use that kind of language around me. <laughs> <laughs> Comes back to that pastor thing. Once you admit you're a pastor, all of a sudden they, they shift into holy language mode, yep. and it's conversation that you know is legitimate is over. Yep. yep. So um, no, definitely important. And I will I will um, plug a, a company that I have absolutely no connection with except as a, a customer, and that's DreamHost.com. Uh, they provide free web hosting and domain registration for nonprofit organizations of all kinds, including churches. And basically all you have to do is uh, send them a note and say, we're a church. Um, and uh, with your, like your, your address and phone number and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a lifetime thing. It's a good professional account that'll do pretty much anything that you would need to do as a church. Um, you know, uh, basically unlimited, uh, space and bandwidth and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, like I said, I'm not, you know, getting paid to, to plug them or anything, but every church should have a website. All right. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, I'm techie and I can actually, you know, set one up and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But every church, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are. You should have a website. All right. Mm -hmm. Because if nothing else, and, and don't for the Lutheran churches out there, if you have a Lutherans online website, Get rid of it. It's horrible because it's like three fourths of the page is thriving ads, and then there's the, this little box in the middle that's your web space, and it's it, it's it basically it sends a message. We know nothing about the internet, okay? Yeah. So and to do just, nothing sometimes is actually better than to yeah. do something really bad. Yeah, yeah. So um, so you know, fi find somebody in your church, even that knows basic HTML, that can set up you know a page or two with a picture of your church and your service times and contact information, you know, if nothing else, um, if, if that's the link to the pastor's do. Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. Perfect. 
So, or speaking of social networking, um, say. the other end of the spectrum is to use Twitter uh, as a preaching method. Don't be too proud of this technological terror. So we've got a, a church in uh, Trinity Wall Street Episcopal Church. Um, it's in New York. <laughs> Look. Yeah, in New York City, right near uh, Ground Zero. Uh, okay. Gorgeous church. They actually used it. Uh, I, I believe that if it's the right one, they used it as one of the um, the hospitals uh, right after the the towers came down, and it's one of the places that they were taking survivors um, to receive medical attention. Was into this church. Okay. So they on Good Friday, from noon to three, um, had a church worker posting a total of eighteen tweets adapted from the Gospel of Mark, and basically telling the story of Jesus' crucifixion through the eyes of uh, Jesus, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Peter, a serving girl, and Pontius Pilate. And so, for instance, they have the example of serving girl is so tired. Caiaphas and the priests have been up all night questioning a man who claims to be the Messiah, and I wait on them. Um, I thought this was a really cool idea. I would have done it a little differently, though. Um, I, I love this idea. I've seen this done before where you have a bunch of fictional characters and they're sort of, um, there's like, they might be tweeting back and forth um, or or just you're sort of hearing the story from their voices and that. So you, what you do is you follow these different characters and then you get the story. Um, and they said that uh, two hours before it began, they had um, roughly 100 followers. By the end, it had grown to more than 1,700. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, the one thing that I would have changed is that they had Jesus being one of the ones tweeting. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see him up on the cross and busting out his iPhone <laughs> to kick out a quick message. Yeah. <laughs> wait, hold before you put that nail in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait, I can't. I can't, I, can't, I can't do my touch screen with one hand here, so yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, because it has uh, you know one from Jesus. Let the scriptures be fulfilled. It is as the prophets wrote. I am who you say that I am. You know, I'm just I'm imagining Jesus on trial and and um, you know, and, and Pontius Pilate is questioning him, and Jesus is sitting there going, "Oh, I am so tweeting this," you know. <laughs> Although, you know, if, if I was Jesus and Je or Jesus was like me with Twitter, then there would actually be people that would accuse me of doing so. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> in, that, in that context, I probably would have. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know. But, but yeah, that, that is sort of a challenge. It, it seems like it would make more sense from people from the outside and, and talking about – I think the other thing that's a challenge is when you're running it off of a single account. Right. Um, it, it really becomes a thing for Christians. Um, and, and I think that that's part of the challenge. Uh, well, I, I think it's sort of a, there's, there's a dual challenge. There's the, the, you have no relationship with the people that you're sharing the message with, um, which, which makes it, it's sort of difficult. It's just sort of a, uh, it's sort of like standing on a street corner with a microphone and spitting a message out into space. Um, and, 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 and those people who want to hear you will hear you. Uh, and, and I think it was cool, and I think it was well done. And, and if I had known about it as a Christian, I probably would have followed just for that that encouragement on that day. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, it, as for a, an evangelism side, I don't think it's necessarily um, probably the most effective use of something like Twitter. I think it's much more effective to use it to to develop relationship and connection with people, uh, and, and you know be able to cross some boundaries maybe because you have common in interests in other areas and and create a space for those because they see that that other side of your life because you tweet not only about your your tech geeky stuff that you have going on or whatever it is that they followed you for, but they they also hear about the faith side of your life because your all of that is going into Twitter in this microblogging feed. Right, right. You know, I've I've. This is definitely focused on Christians. This is a sort of encouragement for Christians thing. Um, I yeah, I can't imagine anybody who's not a Christian, um, you know, sort of jumping in to to follow this. Um, I, I imagine there may have been, but um, maybe you know out of curiosity or whatever. But um, but yeah, I know I know a guy um, that. Is he works in the this he's at one of those big mega churches and and he works in the sound booth, um, and he I'll, I'll come home from church on on Sunday afternoon, and 
there will be uh, um, all of his tweets from throughout the service. <laughs> and it's, you know what? It's cool. And, and I, yeah. I, you know, some people I think would be offended by that, but he's like going, oh, you know, pastor just said this and, you know, and, and, and he just said this and, and, oh, the, um, <clears throat> you know, we just had this baptism. That's so cool. And, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and so, you know, you sort of, I'm, I'm not there at, at his service, but, you know, I'm getting the synopsis from him and yeah. it, it's like. Yeah, hey, you know, and I get these sort of little insights and stuff like that, and and you know what, basically what I'm getting is it's it's his faith, um, being sent out there in 140 characters at a time, you know. Yeah, and I, actually, I've I've done some of the same thing here and there where I'll I'll tweet mid service, uh, not when I'm preaching or anything like that. I've never wait, wait, that was a good line I just had. Let me get that out there. <laughs> you know, I haven't done that one, but um. In, in fact, actually, just this morning, I, somebody asked me about the fact that I had my iPhone out during Easter service, and l- luckily, I was able to say because it was it was true in this case that I had it opened into Evernote and I was taking notes. I was I was as, as thoughts were being made, I was scribbling something down so I wouldn't forget it, just to, to meditate on it later. But um, it becomes you know because some people are really offended by the is he is he texting during church? Is he having some other kind? Con- well, no, I'm I'm engaged in the service, but this is this. Uh, the, the the tweet the the sending out the message is 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 actually part of the engagement. Um, I'm not I don't have an opportunity to respond here in this context, but I do in in a broader way uh, that that won't be disturbing and, and can share a little bit about what's going on with the rest of the world around me. Yep. Now they um they mentioned here the Twitter has 10 million users. I have a hunch after this week that number is quite a bit higher. Yeah. Um, with uh, you know probably about an extra million or so. Um, with all of thanks the, to Oprah, Oprah and uh, Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, that's um, right. The, the the two of them is sort of you know, I I was really expecting you know big fail whales and stuff after all that, but it actually seemed to they held up. Yeah, it held up pretty well. So although you know what that means is now you're going to have you know. 10 million users that follow Oprah, Ellen, and Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore. And that's and, it. And those will be all the people they follow. <laughs> yeah. It's a, I, you know, I think this is it's really good for the, all the celebrity um, Twitters out there. Um, you know, people that following all the different celebrities. It's, it's pretty amazing how many are actually out there. But, you know, please realize, people, that if you're following a celebrity and you send them a little at reply um, – Chances are they're not going to get it. I, you know, I, I, um, I, I do follow uh, Adam Savage from MythBusters, and I actually he actually replied to a note that I sent him once, uh, which I thought was kind of cool because I asked him um, how he was talking about some experiment they're working on, and I asked him how long they usually take before it actually um, gets between filming and actually getting on the show, and he answered. He said it was about three months or so, give or take, depending on the experiment, and I was just kind of like, oh. <laughs> you roll me back, you know. And I, I'm not a starstruck kind of person, you know. Most of my personal heroes um, are people that nobody's ever heard of before, and I've actually either met them or or um, talked to them on the phone. Um, so, you know, that's a um, it. You you, you got to do something to impress me for me to get excited yeah. or whatever. But I I like that show, and you know, it was just kind of yeah. cool to. Absolutely. To hear back. I was gonna say my, my my only you know encounter with fame on Twitter was when the pro blogger responded when Bruce Springsteen did something awful to a microphone at the Super Bowl and <laughs> and I made some comment about it and he replied back. <laughs> there was my brush with Twitter greatness. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a guy who makes his living blogging. <laughs> right. The the odd celebrity cultures that develop in our world. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. He's so, famous on Twitter. He's famous on Twitter. That's a, that's a T-shirt, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it should, should be. be. I want that. I'm famous on Twitter. On Twitter. <laughs> so, so we'd love to hear back uh, from any of you. 
Um, we always appreciate everybody's feedback. If you have thoughts on anything that we've talked about, if you disagree with us, if you agree with us, if you'd like to uh, sort of supplement something we said with some uh, further insight, we really appreciate that. And you can get a hold of us at a podcast at crossfeednews.com. And we did get some feedback. It's been um, last time we recorded an episode was Palm Sunday, so it's been a little while. And uh, we did get some feedback. First of all, um, I have to, <laughs> I got a note uh, from George who who's written us several times, and, and um, he said, hey, guys, this podcast is an audio mess. There are repeated echoes, and it's really garbled. Anyway, have a blessed Easter. <laughs> um, and what here's what happened. Anybody that got the last episode and they started listening to it, and it sounded like, um, it's not, you know, like there was like a, like a five-second echo. Um, what happened was I forgot one of the steps in the post-processing. And didn't realize it, put it out there. And um, so I, I had sort of two audio tracks going at the same time, but separated by about five seconds. And so it was, yeah, it was horrible. So, George, I really appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And anybody else, if you ever, you know, you're listening, you go, oh, this is awful. Let me know. Because as soon as I got that note from him, I went, I fixed it and, uh, you know, re-uploaded. So if anybody, you know, got the old one and said, I can't listen to this and, and got rid of it. Um, if you didn't get the new one, you can go back and get it. Um, so uh, so I, I thanked him for that. And he said, you're welcome since we Lutherans are agents of grace. I forgive you this time. Hey, nice, uh, nice touch on the mouse evangelist on the end. That was that cartoon that he sent us. And uh, joy to you in all the Easter season. Boy, I think LCMS and Wells are unique. You are the only Lutheran bodies in the world refusing to ordain women. Um, <clears throat> not the only ones. Uh, I know that the Lutheran Church in Madagascar doesn't. Um, and which is, it's been kind of a difficult thing for them because they get uh, money from that they really depend on from the Lutheran World Federation, which says you have to have women at your seminary. And they are a conservative Lutheran church body that uh, does not ordain women. And so they allow women at their seminary um, to learn to be things like deaconesses and, and stuff like that. Um, and they have classes for them that way. And that sort of meets the requirement uh, so they can still get that support from the Lutheran World Federation. But, um, yeah, there are, I, I'd say, I'm guessing that in Africa, there are quite a few. There's also one church body in Germany um, that does not, and yeah, there's a handful throughout Europe uh, that don't ordain women that are still, um, you know, pretty conservative in that. So, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, it's a, that's an interesting question that we've discussed several times. So Georgia, thank you for your help uh, and for your feedback. Appreciate that. Um also got a note on our website off of our uh, podcast page, and um, it says, I like your audio podcast and listen often. I don't care too much about the video. Just keep the audio podcast coming. I kind of like the low-quality Skype audio. It gives your podcast edge. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th I thought that was awesome. I <laughs> Um, the, the low quality isn't from Skype. Skype is actually um, uh, higher quality than um, than a regular phone. But uh, it's it's actually well. Part of it is our horrible bandwidth here because we have really flaky DSL um, because we live in a small community where we can't get cable. Um, it doesn't come to our house. And uh, so we we have very limited options as far as that. And in fact, it's been particularly bad this weekend. Um, we've even been having a hard time watching uh, Netflix streaming, which has been driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> and I, I, Joe watches Netflix all the time. Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so it's. I apologize. You know, tonight if if it's been kind of flake. I know the video's kind of flaked out a little bit on us. Um, we got one more comment. Oh, th thanks again uh, for that comment. And um, uh, and this is from um, from David up in uh, in uh, uh, Salem, Virginia. And uh, he says, "Hi guys. One of these days, I'll take time for a more thoughtful response since I listen to every episode." 
For now, I'm just adding my voice to those who have undoubtedly already commented on how difficult... And Dave, you're the only one that wrote us about this. In our last episode, uh, we were, or one or two ago, um, we were talking about um, this ridiculous interview um, that was on TV and, and that, um, you know, how sort of making suggestions of who it would be better to have on to interview uh, in this case about the existence of Satan. Um, and Jim suggested Bruce Metzger. And Dave says that would be, um, it would be really difficult to interview Bruce Metzger since he died in February, 2007. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You that know, was a challenge. <laughs> significant challenge. You know, I don't think our technology is quite there yet. Um, so, uh, says, I hope the three days are filled with blessings for you and Easter is joyous beyond measure. And absolutely it has been, um, so Dave, thanks for that note. Appreciate that. You know, once in a while we just, I mean, because we do this on the fly, we don't check our, you know, sources and sort of double check some of these things. Um, if that we would, if we were actually scripted and, you know, had a teleprompter or something. Yeah. Once in a while we say something just sort of ridiculously stupid. Um, and, and, so, you know, by all means, you know, anybody that, that, you know, catches us on something, please, please correct us. You know, we don't mind. We're not offended at all. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate it. Um, it, it, it really, that made my day. I, I was laughing about it for a long time. And, um, you know, so by all means, let us know that stuff and, um, and, and, you know, it, it'll keep us from making the same mistake again, if, if not, hopefully, you know, um, not necessarily. <laughs> you know, I think you should do a Bruce Metzger interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, thanks for that note. Anybody else, again, the, the email address is podcast at crossfeednews.com or, you know, people have left comments on the podcast page at uh, crossfeednews.com slash podcast. Um, also a reminder, anybody that's watching this on YouTube or Rever or, or MySpace or one of the other uh, video sharing sites uh, that we post this to, um, the video quality is pretty lousy on those sites. If you want to watch the show in uh, better quality, just go over to crossfeednews.com slash podcast and uh, you get, it's much clearer and, um, or you can subscribe to the podcast and on that page, there's all the information there. So you can get it either in video or audio only. So, um, Joe, really glad to have you on the show tonight. Really appreciate it. Here. It's been fun. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so hopefully next time uh, Jim will be back. And um, but really glad to have Joe on in the meantime. And uh, we'd love any anybody have comments about Joe? Think he now he doesn't really look like a pastor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can let us know, and and we'll make sure to pass those comments on to him as well. So looking um, forward to it. So thanks everybody uh, for checking us out again. I hope everyone has a a really joyous Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless.